Hi friends, welcome to my recap of Watchtower Study Article 17. This one is entitled, Never Leave the Spiritual Paradise. What are they even talking about? They take their theme verse out of Isaiah 65 verses 18. They only quote a, a portion of that verse, which they can't because the rest of that verse talks about Jerusalem. It's clear what it's talking about. They say that there's a modern day fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 65, and that began to be fulfilled, take a guess when, 1919. Listen friends, I can't look up all of the verses, but you can. And whenever you're looking up a verse that's quoted or cited here, Try to see if you can pull anything out of it having to do with Jehovah's Witness doctrine. Let me tell you a little bit about the book of Isaiah. I love the book of Isaiah. It can be very difficult to understand. There are some symbolism in it. But really what it's all about is about, it was written about 700 BC, 740 BC, something like that. And it's basically a judgment from God because of their idolatry. It's pun it talks about punishment. They, um, you know, what was so bad about their idolatry was that, you know, they had built high places in the groves and the trees, thinking that nobody could see them, God couldn't see them. And there were sexual sins there, right? They had temple prostitutes, that they had to go through the temple prostitutes to get to the the area of worship or the temple. And not only that, it, it required a child sacrifice. And the God um, of the Bible, God of the Old Testament was like, nope, this is not what I want. This is, this is horrific. I'm going to send my son to die for the sins of the people. I don't want child sacrifice. So Isaiah tells them about this coming judgment, but it also is a beautiful picture of the Messiah, right? Yes, there's going to be punishment, but God is also going to provide the Messiah to deliver you um, and to save the people from the sins. Isaiah chapter 53 is a beautiful picture of Jesus, the Messiah, as the suffering servant. And why is that necessary? Because the people couldn't save themselves, right? It tells of the Messiah coming to redeem the people. Isaiah 55 alludes to the new covenant. We talk about that. Remember Jesus said, the cup, this is the blood, the, the testament of the new covenant in my blood. You have to be under that new covenant to be saved from your sins. This is what Isaiah 65 is about. It's not about a spiritual paradise aligning with the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, okay? Read those chapters. They're beautiful chapters, friend. But anyway, we're going to dive into this. There's their theme verse in its entirety. What's in bold is what they cite. Notice the prior verse. Verse 17, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Verse 18, in bold is what they cite. So this has a fulfillment also in Revelation 21, where it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away. Verse 2, you see this new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride. Verse 3, this is where God tabernacles with men again. He dwells with them in this new Jerusalem. There's no spiritual paradise which began to be fulfilled in 1919. Do you see any of that in these verses? Paragraph 1, there's a paradise on earth today that is full of life and activity. It's teeming with millions of people who enjoy genuine peace, really. Those who are already in this paradise are determined never to leave it. They also want as many people as possible to join them in this unique setting. What is it? The spiritual paradise. Paragraph two. Amazingly, Jehovah has created a serene environment in the midst of a world that Satan has turned into a hate-filled, wicked, and dangerous place. 
Right, listen, friends, the hate-filled, dangerous place is within the organization. Paragraph 3 talks about Isaiah 65, which had its initial fulfillment in the box in 537. At that time, repentant Jews were released from captivity in Babylon. They returned to their homeland. Jehovah blessed his people and helped them to make the devastated city of Jerusalem beautiful again. Paragraph 4, look at this. A second fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy began in 1919. Where's the verse that says this? When Jehovah's modern-day worshipers were set free from captivity to Babylon the Great. Moving down to what's underlined men and women who once exhibited violent, animalistic tendencies put on the new personality. And then moving down, let us see how the spiritual paradise affects us and why we should never leave it. The new personality is put on by Christians. Why and how? Because we die to sin and we're raised to new life. Colossians chapter 1 tells us that when Jesus delivered us from the power of darkness, that we were translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Right. Verse 14, who we have forgiveness of sins through his blood. That's the new personality. We die to sin, right? Colossians, I believe it's chapter 2, says that when, um, when we accept Christ as our Savior, God takes this, does this circumcision made without hands, and he cuts away, he cuts asunder this dying flesh from the soul that's saved. We become this spirit-filled, uh, um, and, and I'm not saying like in an experiential mysticism type of spirit-filled, we just become sealed with the Holy Spirit, and we put on this new personality, this new personality of being saved. Why? Because we have Christ's righteousness. It's not about being good, right? It's about being saved. Okay, let's keep going. Paragraph five in the box. Jehovah abundantly satisfies the spiritual needs of his worshipers. We have his Holy Spirit, his written word, and ample spiritual food so that we can eat, drink, and rejoice. So here's some of the verses that they cite. They cite from Amos as well. Paragraph 6. In his prophecy, Joel used such staples of life as grain, wine, and olive oil to show that Jehovah generously supplies his people with what they need, including spiritual food. And then it says that he does so through uh, his, their Bible-based publications assemblies, and then when they partake, they feel healthier and more refreshed. Paragraph 7 in the box, the upbuilding truths and comforting promises in God's word, and our solid hope. What's a solid hope? Based on Christ's ransom sacrifice, give us a good condition of the heart. They don't even partake, friends. There are so many promises in these books, Amos and Joel, has nothing to do with the Jehovah's Witness dystopian paradise where they're going to be working for billions and billions of years, where they have this great educational program where people can learn about their God, right? So people throughout time who have had the scriptures, the Bible, the manuscripts, they haven't heard about their God because their God is found in these extra biblical texts. These Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be teaching them the lies about their God. But we know that this spiritual paradise is a phantom. It will never come to fruition. Never. The Bible tells us what will happen. And it will be a new Jerusalem where we will live. And people will be resurrected with incorruptible bodies. They will not take a thousand years to attain to perfection. Paragraph 8, the love and unity among Jehovah's people are two major characteristics of the spiritual paradise. This bond of union gives us an idea of what life will be like in the new world. Then we hear this story about this Christian sister. She said, what's underlined, I did not know how to be happy, not even in my family. Wow. 
The first time I saw love in action was among Jehovah's Witnesses. And then it says, no matter what this world thinks of Jehovah's servants, they have an honorable name reputation with his universal family. See, it's all about that honorable name. No matter what's happening in the court systems, it's all about keeping everything quiet so as to not tarnish Jehovah's name, right? We're gonna move on to paragraph 10. Even now it's soothing to our nerves to be at our Christian meetings where we can relax and put up, put behind us the stresses of this wicked world. I've been recapping every single study article for several years now. There's no way to relax at a Christian, at one of their meetings. These articles are filled with fear and dread and guilt and anguish. It's so unbelievable to me, the words that are used here. They can relax, they have comforting promises, greater love. Notice what's underlined there. It says, those who remain in the spiritual paradise will see the complete fulfillment of God's promise of a new heavens and a new earth, but you must remain within. They even, they even state, the Bible says there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. What is the Jehovah's Witness thinking was sitting in the audience reading this, a new heavens and a new earth? It says it right there, but they spiritualize it. You must remain within, remember? Here you have this, um, <laughs> All the love and unity going on around them and this one guy looking at his phone with a big old frown on his face. Paragraph 11, grateful and excited, what's underlined. No wonder he is using us to direct people away from the spiritual parched organizations of this old world. You see what they do? They make them believe that they're special. And I want you to notice the question on paragraph 11. What's underlined? How? should the spiritual paradise affect us? They even tell them how they should be affected. They must remain within. Paragraph 12, we are also grateful for and excited about the hope we have as residents of the spiritual paradise. Just think of all that we will do and see in God's new world. Billions and billions of years of work, friends. The conclusion of Isaiah chapter 65 is of this new heavens and this new earth where there'll be no more sorrow, no more weeping. There'll be prosperity and longevity. It's a real thing in the new Jerusalem, not in the Jehovah's Witness paradise, friends. 13, peaceful and safe. With the help of God's spirit, many who formerly had beastly personalities have made remarkable changes in their life. You could read Isaiah 65, 25. They've tamed their former undesirable traits. Granted, God's people are still imperfect, so we'll continue to make mistakes. I want to show you 1 Corinthians 6, 10, and 11, right? So verse 10 talks about thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, nor extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But verse 11 is the key. And such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Jehovah's Witnesses want the, their followers, the indoctrinated, to be good, right? To be good and morally clean to put on their version of the new personality. 1 Corinthians 6 tells us that we were those things, but we're washed, we're sanctified, set apart for a holy purpose, right? What is that holy purpose? Speaking about this beautiful truth of salvation through faith alone in Christ's shed blood. Read Hebrews, read the book of Hebrews. It's so beautiful. It talks about all of this, who we are now because the ultimate lamb of God shed his blood so that we could live. So I'm not gonna read paragraph 14, but I sum it up in what I wrote. This violent and immoral man was in and out of prison by age 20. He started attending meetings and changed from being lion-like 
to lamb life. You see what they do is they tie in words from these verses to make it appear that they're being fulfilled, but they're not. That's why it's so important to separate the two. You have watchtower doctrine, and then you have the verses. Read the verses with an open eye, be a Berean, and test the spirit to see if it's from God. This spirit of this spiritual paradise is not from God. And how do we know that? First of all, not they tell us that in that November, was it 2013 watchtower, that the governing bodies are not inspired. But we know it's not from God because their doctrine does not line up with the verses. 15 in the box, uh, talking about Isaiah 65, verse 25 ends with the words, says Jehovah, his words always come true. That's correct. Isaiah 55, God's words always come true. The paragraph goes on. The spiritual paradise is already a reality. No, it's not. Jehovah has created a brotherhood, huh, that is truly unique. Among his people, we can find relative peace and enjoy a safe oasis in a violent world. That's not true. It goes on, for these reasons, we want to help as many as possible to join us in our Christian brotherhood. We can do this by focusing on making disciples. They cite Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And what does that do? It tells them how to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jehovah's Witnesses don't baptize in this manner. It's right there. Their baptism is all about dedicating themselves to their God who operates through an organization and men in New York. Paragraph 16. Each of us has an important role to play in making the spiritual paradise attractive to others. Is the Bible not enough? Is Christ's sacrifice not enough? We can fulfill this role if we imitate Jehovah. He does not drag people into his organization against their will. Well, it goes on to say that good-hearted people learn about Je Le Jehovah's loving qualities, are irresistibly drawn to him. Paragraph 17, one way we can attract others to the spiritual paradise is by treating our fellow worshipers with love and kindness. Okay, so paragraph 18 talks about trying to see Christian brothers as Jehovah sees them. In the box, it says we do so by focusing on their positive qualities and not on their imperfections, which will eventually disappear. There's 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 53. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. Listen, being perfect does not mean being sinless. When the New Testament talks about somebody being perfect, you can look it up. Do a word search on the word perfect. It talks about being perfect in your doctrine, having the right doctrine. And what is that doctrine that saves? 1 Corinthians um, 15, 1 through 4. <laughs> totally forgot it for a minute. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to Scripture. That's the doctrine that saved, saves. Being sinless means having your sin, sins cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way we can get to God through Christ, our mediator. Why? Because he shed his blood. We then take on his righteousness, not our own, right? All right, let's wrap this up. Stay inside the spiritual paradise. How we appreciate our spiritual paradise. It's more beautiful than ever before, and it's inhabited by more praisers of Jehovah than ever before. But beware, you can never leave it. There's no spiritual paradise today, friends. None at all. We live in this fallen world, and we're sanctified, we're saved, and we're translated into his kingdom because we've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Our hope, the hope of Christians, the true Christians, is greater than this. There's so much inconsistency. They say that the God of the Bible, everything the God of the Bible says come true, comes true, but nothing that the God of this organization says comes true. You see, we're talking about two different gods with the same name. The God of the Old Testament's name is Jehovah. That God of the Old Testament 
is different than this God of this organization whose name is Jehovah. Two different gods, two different doctrines. I have to turn my air conditioning off when I film because it makes, you could, you could hear it and I end up sweating by the end of my videos. <laughs> Listen, friends, turn to Jesus because he died for you. I say this at the end of every one of my videos. Become translated in the, into the kingdom of his dear son. It's not a mystical thing. It's a fact, not a feeling. Do it today. I appreciate you tuning in. And listen, I always forget to say this, but did you know that I have a website with uh, a ton of resources on there? Um, I used to do some uh, Zoom Bible studies and I need to get that started again. We have recorded Bible studies on there. Everything's for free. I also have a Facebook group. It's called JW Escape. It's a private group for like-minded people either Jehovah's Witnesses or ex-Jehovah's Witnesses or people who are interested in Jehovah's Witnesses, but with a Christian flair. We try to monitor it as much as possible, but there's, I don't know, over 5,000 people in there. It's a really good, it's an opportunity to, um, you know, collaborate with like-minded individuals. So check all of those out, friends. I appreciate you watching. Appreciate you tuning in. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a great day.